and unshaken hope. For our hope for you is unshaken. Beloved, I would submit that if you were to categorize a good life according to the necessary ingredients that make up for a healthy, wholesome, and full life, most of us would neglect certain ingredients. We would throw in a heaping full of hope. We would throw in tablespoonfuls of prosperity. We'd add quarts of, of, of decency. But most of us would miss the bitter herbs. And often we don't realize that it is the bitter herbs that often bring out the fullness of flavor in the patois called life. We sing it one more time. We come, we come. Yes. We'll lead it. We're trusting in the Lord. He never fails. I'm singing, oh.
in the Lord. Is that your testimony today? God has been very faithful. He's been better to us than we've been to ourselves. David says, love the Lord, all ye saints, and the Lord preserves the faithful. He's been so faithful to us. And we owe him everything. Without him, we could not move. Without him, we couldn't be in our own right mind. Without him, he woke us up this morning and got us on our way. It was his finger of love that did that, nothing that we did on our own. So we have come to praise him. So let us give the Lord a hand praise him. For his goodness, for his mercy, for his faithfulness. Let us pray. Eternal and all wise God, I was glad when they said unto us, let us go into the house of the Lord. For this is the day that you have made, one we have never seen before and shall never see again. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. Lord, we've come to edify, glorify, and magnify your name because you are truly worthy. We come this day, Father God, to give you praise and honor Lord, we ask that you would move among this service. We know that you're already here. We ask that you would touch as only you can, Father God. That as you move from heart to heart and breast to breast, as you touch these dancers and the choir, Lord, we pray, Father God, that someone will hear this message this day as we sit in our tent doors and come running asking, what must I do to be saved? So, Lord, we love you. We give you honor, glory, and praise. And when we leave this place, Father God, let it be evident that we have spent time with you. Lord, in this crazy world, we ask that you would give us eyes to see the very best in others. That you would give us a heart to forgive the worst. That you would give us a mind, Father God, to forget. And most of all, Lord, give us a soul that will never, never fail to be faithful to you. Lord, this is our humble prayer we pray. It's in the matchless name of your son and our savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. And the redeemed of the Lord said amen, 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 amen. and amen. You'll see behind us a screen, but if you choose to go to the hymnal, our hymn for the morning is 368. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thou said the Lord. How I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust him more. Let us sing to the glory of God.
Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Colossians, and it is Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Again, that's Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Let us all read together. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. May be
Come on, put your hands together. Give God some praise. Amen. Put your hands together. Come on, come on.
surely work it out now. And my God can do it. All the sopranos, come on, sopranos. opportunity to pinpoint the welcoming of our first time guests to the Mount Olive Baptist Church. So if you are visiting with us for the very first time, we ask that you stand up and let us acknowledge your presence in God's sanctuary. Be aware that this is not just a one time extension of welcome, but it is an ongoing process. Well, you are welcome as soon as you came in. You are welcome now. And at any time in the future that you feel that you have a need or a desire to come worship with us, please feel free to do so. We also welcome those that are worshiping with us through our live stream. We ask that if you find yourself in the Washington, D.C. area, that you will come to the Mount Olive Baptist Church and worship God who is multi-denominational. He is a God not just of us, for the God of us all. So Mount Olive, let us now stand, and I do welcome you on behalf of our pastor. What a wonderful word of encouragement. Yes. Yes. Hold on, things will change. Hold on, it will get better. And the security in holding on is only guaranteed by the strength of what you hold on to. We are glad to have so many in worship today. Praise God for your presence on this beautiful second Sunday in August. Yeah. 
I was in New Orleans all week at the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and you all were hotter here than we were there. We were washed out, but we had a good time. And I knew we, I had come back to a hot August when two things happened, one of which happened this morning. When I walked out of National Airport and the door opened and that heat slapped me in the face, I knew it was a hot August. And I knew it was a hot August when Jimmy Taylor comes to church casually dressed. Can I be colloquial? Y'all know it's show sure enough hot when Jimmy Taylor is not suited down. So we just praise God for the heat to get him to come casually to casual summer. Amen. And we are also delighted to have all of these graduates from Hoffman Boston School as the school celebrates its centennial anniversary as an institution of education. I understand that the last graduating class was 1964 which is the year after that uh, schools in Virginia were integrated. And I'm looking at them and they still look good. Let, let me qualify that most of them still look good. They want to make a presentation to the church, so I'll ask that the designee would come forward and do that at this moment. Just out of curiosity, if the last, come on, come on, the last class was 1964, who is your oldest surviving graduate and what class? So when I call you old lady now, I say I'm legit. <laughs> Y'all got to understand, the Lord's down and I have that kind of relationship. I call her old woman. When I first got here, she used to call me young man. Now she calls me middle-aged man. <laughs> Amen. Please. Reverend Victor, it's my honor to present to uh, Mount Olive Church a contribution from the not just the alumni, the graduating alumni, but also people who went through, because I didn't graduate, I went through the 11th grade. And in my class, class of 1965, I was bused from this community to Wakefield High School. My graduating class in Hoffman, Boston would have been 62 or 63 people. My graduating class at Wakefield High School was 883 people. They put us, for the school picture, they put us on the football bleachers and had a moving camera. So we went from being an individual to finding, having to find yourself in the picture. But we are here today because of the support that the churches throughout the community gave to us. Those of you who were not here back in the day need to know that Mount Olive was just a foundation for our community. The ministers worked together all of us, on behalf of integration. And we would just be remiss if we didn't acknowledge just to say thank you. We're deeply appreciative of all we have done. I have to say good memories when the old church, the, all of the churches traditionally had a Christmas sing. We got together at one of the churches and the high school choir, we all had a Christmas sing that started the Christmas season. Every church had a couple of pre, uh, songs, but at the end of the service, all of the church choirs and the high school choir got together in this 
Carla and mm -hmm. sang the Hallelujah Chorus and kicked off the Christmas season. Good memories come from our churches. So on behalf of the alumni and those of us who did not graduate, I want to make this presentation to the church. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you have been and continue to be to our community. Bless your heart. If you would give it to the chairman. Amen. I mean. Come on, put your hands up. Come on, man.
Come on and give him glory. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. Yeah. There's none like you, Jesus. None like you, Lord. Hallelujah.
Let us pray. God, we trust you. While sometimes fear may cause us to doubt, we still trust you. For fear is really a part of trust and doubt is really a part of trust. All of us are always battling back doubt and fear, but in the process, Lord, we're going to get to the point where we can say, I trust you. For God, I'll live and for God, I'll die. I trust you. Though you slay me, yet will I trust you. So God, we trust you. Knowing that you will make all things well and all things right in your own time and in your own way. So give us the patience till you have performed your completed work. Now, oh God, we ask that you would grant us the anointing of your spirit for the moment of proclamation. Endow us with the real preacher from on high and within. And dear God, allow your word to leap from the printed page to be not only inscribed on paper, but indelibly on our hearts so that we might become new creations in Christ Jesus. It's in the name of the one who died, who lives, and who lives forevermore. Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. And the people of God all said together, Amen. As we continue to wrestle with this sermon series, Resurrecting Hope, I want to direct you to the second letter to the church at Corinth or as one of the leading presidential candidates says, two Corinthians. And he says he goes to church. To two Corinthians, two Corinthians, chapter one, verses one through seven. Let us stand, all those who can and will, to give reverence to the word of God. As we look at these first seven verses of the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. Hear the lesson. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, including all the saints throughout Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in our affliction so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we are ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we are also suffering. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our consolation. Thus ends the reading of the word, amen. I want to talk about an unshaken hope. Amen. An unshaken hope. For our hope for you is unshaken shaken. Beloved, I would submit that if you were to categorize a good life according to the necessary ingredients that make up for a healthy, wholesome, and full life, most of us would neglect certain ingredients. We would throw in 
a heaping full of hope, we would throw in tablespoonfuls of prosperity. We'd add quarts of, of, of decency. But most of us would miss the bitter herbs. And often we don't realize that it is the bitter herbs that often bring out the fullness of flavor in the patois called life. And one of the ingredients that we would invariably, I believe, neglect to include would be that of disappointment. But I would also admit, submit to you that in every part of life, there are some disappointments. You're not going to live beyond the day without experiencing disappointments. And disappointments are really unmet expectations. They are hopes that have been dashed and uh, quelled by the necessities of life. Disappointments that you didn't get the job that you were looking for or disappointments that uh, characterized by the lack of a promotion. Disappointments that you didn't live up to your own self-expectations. But I would submit to you that disappointments are of a particularly bitter element when they are impinged by other people. It's a devastating disappointment when someone does not live up to your expectation. When they do not satisfy the hopes and the dreams and the, the, the expectations that you have of others. And yet, beloved, if we are going to be netted together in relationships of any kind, you had better learn to deal with human disappointments. It is woven into the fabric of life. It is one of those necessary ingredients to the wholeness of human experience. Unless one is a, a hermit and a recluse and you are engaged with people, you are going to invariably be disappointed. Regardless of the nature of the relationship, because people are people, you're going to be disappointed. Husbands disappoint wives. Wives disappoint husbands. Children disappoint parents. And parents disappoint children. Employers disappoint employees. And employees disappoint employers. Students disappoint teachers. And, teacher, and, and teachers disappoint students. The list goes on and on ad infinitum. Depending on the nature of the relationship, disappointments by others will happen. And often those disappointments are because we have set expectations of others. And we look, even though we don't believe it, we have set high expectations for others and often our hopes and our dreams and others are shattered shattered like broken glass that have fallen from tables it is because we love so deeply that we have such high expectations and such deep disappointments are a sign of deep love. It was Dr. King that said deep disappointment is a sign of deep love. For you not to be disappointed is a sign that you really don't care. Right. Right. 
There is no feeling and there is no meaning in the relationship. Disappointment among in human relationship is a sign and a symbol that there's something worth salvaging and there's something of enduring and abiding value. But we sometimes are so disappointed that we lose confidence in other people. There is a quotation that circulates of an unknown origin that says, sometimes just when I think I know people, they disappoint me in ways I never thought they could. And isn't that such a true statement? That when you think you know somebody, when you've got them figured out, then the bottom of expectation falls out and you're left with disappointment. And I would submit to you today that we can cast that human phenomenon, that drama of relationship beyond the person, interpersonal level to a much larger communal level. We're living in a time where we're, what we're really seeing is a loss of the death of hope in people. We come now to the point where the African-American community distrust police. Police distrust the African-American community. And regardless of whether we're Democrats or Republicans, there's a large and growing distrust of government. Workers distrust corporate America when it is unable to provide living wages and benefits that were once status quo, now you are looking for a job that'll give you some health care and insurance, which is becoming increasingly more difficult to find. We're living in a state where we're losing confidence in people. And when we begin to lose confidence in people, the natural reaction is retraction. We withdraw from that which God has created for us as our benefit and our blessing. And Lord knows it ain't easy dealing with other people. Come on now. All of us are a part of somebody's family. All of us. And, and, and you can imagine if it's difficult to get along at the family reunion. How much more difficult it's going to be to get along with folk in church. And to get along with folk on the job. And to get along with folks at the government level, local, regional, state, and national. If it's difficult for you to deal with your own dysfunctions in your own family, imagine how difficult it is to bring folks together in the larger context of community. It's not an easy thing, but it is a necessary thing because there is blessing that takes place in living together and working together. An old African proverb says that if you want to go fast, go alone. <laughs> but if you want to go far, take others with you. We, beloved, work better and best in spite of all of the difficulties of relationship when we are formed in community. And yet, it's difficult to live in community because people disappoint us. And I dare say that all of us that sometimes battle both uh, those double demons of skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism which says people aren't ever going to change. That the more things change, the more things stay the same. And what, a, what a, a lamentable state of existence. When you can look at another child of God and say they will never change. 
you've lost all hope. You lost all inspiration. And you've lost all love for the other. And then we battle also that, that demon of, of cynicism, which says, in essence, that people are only self-motivated. The only reason some folks do what they do is to get up and get over and to take advantage of you. Beloved, when the cynics and the skeptics come together, they create for us a community that is bereft of hope. And when we lose hope in people to get better, to change, to grow, to evolve, to mature, then we have, in essence, eased God out of all of the formulas of human growth and dynamics. That's what makes these words by the Apostle Paul so remarkable this morning. He says to the Corinthian church that our hope in you is unshaken. These are remarkable words. They're not just literary diamonds and gems that have been etched into uh, the script of scripture for enduring value. No, these are remarkable words when you consider the context of the pastoral relationship between Paul and Corinth. The first letter Paul had written was met with a great deal of hostility because he had to chastise them in love for their wrongdoing. The church at Corinth was a difficult congregation. Their moral temperament was chilly. Their spiritual outlook was selfish. Their social orientation was classist. Their sexual understanding was permissive. Their Christian fellowship was cliquish. And their theological grounding was shaky. And so for Paul then to say, for a congregation that did not want to hear the truth, that my hope in you is unshaken, is a remarkable declaration of his confidence in the ability of people to evolve. Beloved, when we look at our world today, unless we can recapture some of the energy and dynamism of the apostles' words, then I'm afraid we're going to find ourselves in a situation of social collapse. And all of us are going to retreat to our own little conclaves. And none of us will ever learn to work together. We'll just become our own little cliques. We're not far from that now. We'll just become our own little groups, our own little sororities, our own little fraternities, our own little churches, and never will we get to the part of living in the larger community as God intended. Paul says to them, my hope for you is unshaken. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. Paul here is saying to the Corinthian church, because of who you are and who you have been, I'm not really setting lofty expectations for you. Watch this, I'm going somewhere. You, you've let me down time and time again. You failed spiritually time and time again. When you should be a spiritual giant, you find yourself as a spiritual pygmy living beneath your potential and possibility. My, my, my confidence is not so much in you, but my confidence is for you. 
I'm not putting all of my hope in you. I'm not putting all of my proverbial spiritual eggs in one basket. No, I know you have the potential to mess up because I've got the potential to mess up. But my hope is not in you. It's for you. In other words, my confidence is in God who can work a miracle in your life. My confidence in God is that he can straighten you up and fix you up. My confidence in God is that he can turn your lives around so that you grow into the colossal giant rather than the dwarf that you're acting like now. My, my, my hope for you is unshaken. You see what Paul understood in this uh, formula here on human growth and dynamics is that he understands all of us can mess up. And all of us have the potential to be a disappointment. Just as others have disappointed you if you're really honest with yourself, if you're really honest with yourself, you are a disappointment to somebody else. Oh yeah, you, you didn't go to college when you should have and had straight A's and scholarships. You didn't get a job and keep a job when I made phone calls for you and set you up so that you wouldn't have to go through normal interview processes. You, you didn't live up to my expectations. So many of us sit here with dual identities. I've disappointed some people. And you got to come to grips with that, beloved. That not only have some folk disappointed me, but I've disappointed some other folks. Yes. So my hope is not in you. My hope is for you. So how can the apostle make such a bold declaration in a church that is dealing with its own spiritual deficiencies? Well, the first reason that Paul can say that is because the same God that did something for him is the same God that can do something for you. Paul here is joining himself to the Corinthian congregation by sharing with them his suffering and letting them know that as long as they live counterculturally to the world, they too shall endure suffering and hardship. Sometimes you suffer not because you did something wrong, but because you did something right. And then Paul says to them, if God can console me, he can console you. The reason that I know and I've got a hope for you is because God has done something for me. And if God did it for me, he can sure enough do it for you. And that ought to be somebody's testimony here today. Somebody's witness that I got turned around because I saw somebody else get turned around. I got off my addiction because I had words with a recovering addict. I got a job and went to work every day because I saw a man go to work every day to take care of his family. I'm changed. Because I've seen other changed individuals. The God that did something for me. The one that consoles me. Is also the one that can console you. And if you consider, says Paul, who I am. Someone that is of low value and estimation. Then certainly God ought to do it for the rest of y'all. When you consider who I am, one who, who held the coats while they stoned Stephen, one who was an apostle born out of time, one who persecuted the church, if God would do it for somebody like me, surely he's able, surely he's willing, 
surely he's capable surely he'll do it in your life so beloved before you start disregarding people you ought to remember who you really are See, I submit to you one of the problems that church folk have and the reason that the world says that we are so judgmental and rightfully so is because we forget what the Lord has done for us. Come on here now. You ain't always been perfect. You ain't always been cute. You ain't always been saved. You ain't always been holy. You ain't always had a church going mine, but praise be to God. He looked beyond my fault. So before you go looking down on somebody else, you need to just take a step back. Rewind the button before you got saved and look at who you really are. And then look where God has brought you. Praise him. I may not be what I used, what I want to ought to be. But I thank him that I'm not what I used to be. The reason that I can have an unshakable hope for you is the God that did something for me. Is also the God that can do something for you. And the second reason that I can have an unshaken hope is because you've got a higher work than your present position. Paul here says that we console others or whether we receive the consolation from God in any affliction so that we might console somebody else in their affliction. The reason, beloved, I got a hope that you can change is because God's got a work for you to do. And if God's got a work for you to do, you can't do it where you presently are. But the work is not invalidated because of your present predicament. In other words, the calling of God on your life is up even though you might be down. Which requires then that you got to come up in order to do the work. And beloved, if God has called you up here, then I know he's going to bring you from here. God's reputation is at stake and God's name is on the line if you stay right where you are but you got to come on up a little higher. These are the words from the same Paul that says I, I, I don't uh, count it as if I have apprehended but I press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I got to strain and work and get there because the Lord has a higher work for me to do. Many of us grow so contented with where we are. And in church, one of the greatest and most dangerous words is the word great. I shun when I hear the word great applied in church. Oh, this is a great church. That's a great preacher. That's a great choir. The, those are great members. But unless you're serving with the heart of Jesus Christ, what you have defined is not greatness, but success by human categories and standards. No, we can be assured of a higher confidence in people and an unshakable hope for them because God has worked for all of our lives. Amen. Howard Thurman, the great mystic, who was the dean of Marsh Chapel and also the dean of Howard's Rankin Chapel, great theologian and mystic, 
when he would stand to preach after an introduction and all of his accolades had been mentioned. PhD from Boston University, all of the likes. Dr. Thurman would say of his introducer, they have put a crown upon my head upon which one day I hope to arise. Amen. Amen. All of us ought to have a level of humility it says we hadn't gotten there just yet. And if I'm on my way in all of my incompleteness, then I ought to cut you some slack in your deficiencies. The reason that I hope for you is unshakable is because God has a higher work. And in the higher work, God will bring it to completion. One day we shall wear the crowns that have been placed so loftily above our heads. One day we shall get to where we need to be. But until then, let us have a hope in others. Then lastly, we can have an unshaken hope because we're in this thing together. The apostle says to the Corinthian church, even though you have disappointed me and even though you don't have the strongest of Christian values and virtues, but if you're sharing in the suffering that I'm experiencing and you're experiencing the consolation that I am experiencing, That means we are co-laborers in suffering and in consolation. In other words, we're in this thing together. And as you suffer, I can learn something from your suffering. And as you are consoled, I can learn something from your consolation. As you go through it, you can help me go through it. As you endure it, You can help me endure it. As you give God the praise in the midst of your problem, you help me to praise God in the midst of my tribulation. As you triumph over your trials, you inspire me to keep on keeping on in my own situation. Because we're all in this thing together. And none of us has all of the answers or the solutions. But all of us can learn from somebody else. That's why the Bible says that a child shall lead them. Because children have something to offer. That's why we all not discredit our old folk. Because they got some wisdom that has been learned through the years. But if I can take an old person and a young person and ever get them beyond the digital divide, then I've got something that can bring down strongholds because I found the wisdom in the experience of the young and the old. We're in this thing together. And when you stop thinking about I and start talking about we, when you stop talking about my and start talking about us, then you have discovered that the God of all consolation is the God that will bring you out. And sometimes I believe you go through what you go through so that you can help me go through what I need to go through. Come on here now. Have you ever gone to the bedside of somebody in the hospital and you go to visit and minister to them? But when you walk out, you understand that I didn't bless them. They ended up blessing me. That's because they understand that in the midst of all of their troubles and in the midst of all of their trials, I've received something from the Lord that makes me cool as a cucumber and makes me steady as a rock because I received the consolation of the God of my salvation. I'm not shaken because I'm on a bedrock. 
I'm not tore up from the floor because I'm leaning on everlasting arms. I'm not destroyed because I'm standing on a sure foundation. I've been consoled. Have you got something from the Lord that'll give you that peace that passes all understanding? Have you received that thing from the Lord that gives you faith in the midnight season? Have you gotten that thing that will allow you to speak joy in the time of trouble? I tell you, there's something. I don't know what it is, but I echo with the songwriter who said something within me that holdeth the reins. Something within me that banishes pain. Oh, that I know. I said I can't explain it sometimes. I don't know why I haven't lost it. I don't know why I didn't go off the deep end. I don't know why I haven't been tore up from the floor up. But all that I know, I've got something, great God, something within me. Do you have, I said, do you have that something? Do you have it? I said, do you have it that'll give you peace, that'll pass all understanding? Do you have it that'll put joy in your soul? Do you have it that'll give you a peace that doesn't make sense? Do you have it when enemies are all around that can say, fret not thyself because of evildoers? Yes, I've got that something. Yes. And can I help you? It's really not something. It's someone. I've got some Holy Ghost power on the inside. Holy Ghost power that makes the difference. Holy Ghost power that gives me hope in the time of trouble. Say yes, yes, oh yeah. There's something about the people of God. So don't give up on other folks. Same God that's working on you is working on your neighbor. That's why I don't tell y'all to slap hands with your neighbor and turn around and talk to your neighbor. Because when I come to church, I don't need my neighbor. I need an encounter with God. Because I'm trying to get close to the fire so that he can work on me. And I know if he's working on me, he'll work on you. Consolation of God. We received it as a precious gift from the eternal. So if today you have that something, you've had that kind of intimate and in depth encounter with the divine, then I encourage you to come forward. For this is the moment of decision. Jeremiah Wright wrote a book a number of years ago that posed the interrogative, what makes you so strong? And when you look at your life, beloved, that's an appropriate question. What makes you strong? What keeps you from going off the deep end? What keeps you grounded? 
in a world that is characterized with seismic activity in which the ground upon which you walk can shake and move at any moment. What makes you strong? When the police continue to take the lives of our young brothers and sisters, what makes you so strong when the economic boom in this country is the last to come to our community? What makes you so strong when historic neighborhoods are now being decimated and their history wiped clean? because others come in and don't respect the tradition. What makes you so strong? When you held that baby in your arms and forecasted such great things for him or her, and now you regret ever having given birth to the child and brought him or her in the world. What makes you so strong? When the doctors tell you, you gotta have surgery, and I can't forecast the outcome, what makes you so strong? Well, let me tell you, beloved, it's not because you got a degree from Harvard, Yale, or some HBCU. It's not because you're cute, but it's because there's a God above us who sits high and looks low and from time to time comes down the staircase of eternity to visit us in our earthly moorings. The question is, do you have that something? If you don't have it, we invite you to come and get it today. And the beautiful thing about it is it doesn't cost you anything. It's a free gift. Jesus has already paid it all. It's a gift. All you've got to do is come and claim your prize. The gift of eternal life and intimacy with Jesus Christ. If you're here, won't you come? Is there one today that will make a decision for Jesus Christ? You may come to be baptized by letter from another Baptist church of the same faith and order or by your Christian experience. We invite you to come as the choir sings that grand old hymn of the church. Something within me I cannot explain. <laughs> 